welcome back to the BDGE Dynasty Fantasy Football Channel. Hank, as always, the second time, but it's going to be as always from now. It's Adam, it's Andrew, it's two guys with names starting as A that I know very dearly already, but I keep confusing them. So if you guys confuse them, it's not a big deal. Just remember me. I'm the only important one here. But we're going to do a little content with you guys today, you know, because you're so gorgeous and I love looking at your faces. Today, what we're going to do is help you set up a Dynasty League, all right? It is a game that's becoming rapidly popular. And we get the comments, we get the questions, we get the DMs, the messages, the emails. Hey, I want to start a dynasty league with my friends, but I don't even know where to start. So we're going to go from A to Z, from one to a billion with all the technical settings, scoring, leagues, whatever you need to make sure, and this is the important part, that we are setting your league up for success with longevity. It's easy to set up a league. But it's hard to maintain the Dynasty League for five-plus years. The number of leagues that fizzle out after two to three years, phenomenally high. But we have tons of tips and tricks because we played in a lot of Dynasty Leagues. We played in a lot of Dynasty Leagues for a long time. So we have come across the things that matter, the things that don't matter, the things that will ruin your league, and the things that will help save your league. Okay? So that's what today's video is. Make sure, if you enjoy the content, you subscribe to the channel. If you're here from the Redraft channel, this Dynasty Fantasy Football channel We'll start only posting these videos, so you got to subscribe over there if you're a Dynasty player. Make sure you are subscribed to both Adam and Andrew's YouTube channels. Those will also be linked right beneath the video in the notes section. And I am ready to go. Let's start off with the, you yapping. The first, the first and most important thing is decipher your friends, all right? If you, if you set up with the wrong friends, your league's going to be fucked early. Correct, which is why you can go join the BDGE Discord because we are setting up Dynasty Leagues for you in there. Shout out to Sexual Patterson. Now, first question. We do have the Sleeper app that we're going to be using today. We're going to go through all the settings and tools. We're actually going to set up a league for you today. Have you guys played on other leagues? And I don't want to go too deep because if there are any leagues that don't compare to Sleeper, we'll just move past it. But are there any leagues that you like that you, or any league uh, platforms platforms that you like that you would actually suggest over a Sleeper or over anything else? This is not a sponsored video whatsoever, but this is the preferred platform to play Dynasty on. No, no I, I strongly would prefer Sleeper. Uh, I, sometimes when, when people want to get really, really customizable, they'll go to MFL because you could basically do anything, but I can't personally stand being on MFL S leagues. Sleeper, Actually, I tend to not look at it as much because yeah. I don't I like the platform. I think Sleeper's, and especially for people who are just starting a Dynasty League, Sleeper is so easy to use, and it, it does give you all the things that you need in a Dynasty League, so yep. it's, just, it's the best one to go to if you're just starting out. Yeah, super customizable, and... They're always building. They're a tech company, you know, and what that means is they're building for the audience. They listen to hey. user feedback. <laughs> they listen to user feedback. You think that was going to fucking take me off course? Absolutely not. They listen <laughs> to user feedback, and then they build the product based on what you want, which is literally di the direct opposite of pretty much every other platform in the industry. So we would suggest going to Sleeper, sleeper.app. They have both a website and a mobile app, and we're going to jump right into the app. This is what the screen looks like. If you're already in leagues, you'll see that plus button at the top there, that white one next to the search bar. We're going to hit plus. We're going to hit fantasy football. We are going to hit create league. Hang. 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 <laughs> create new league from scratch. Dynasty is on the right. And the next most important thing is right here. How many 12. people? You could play with however many you want, but you can. We'll but set up 12. I thought we were talking about longevity here, Mr. Andrew. I think I th yeah I mean I mean we don't have to debate it I think ten to twelve if that's what you play with I wouldn't say played anything less than that yeah I mean listen like this kind of setting people, is no it's no different than redraft league yeah. so some people play, play thirty two yeah do it get it how you live it uh, twelve is the ideal one whatever we'll set it up there that that stuff doesn't matter for dynasty realistically now draft type this is an is interesting conversation to be had because there are different yeah. types of draft type why don't we start off by talking about the biggest differences between dynasty and redraft because there are we get so many questions like I'm in a dynasty league we get to keep three players it's like that ain't a dynasty league that's no, a yeah. keeper that's a keeper so, so a dynasty league you are going to have when you set up this choose your draft type this is actually setting up what you call a startup draft okay so very important to differentiate startup draft because that's only going to be done once in a dynasty league when you start it up when you hang <laughs> when you hang you start it up and if you do a snake draft here right this will be Literally, you're drafting this team with the idea of keeping every player for the rest of time. Now, obviously. Yeah, so the biggest difference is, is that you are keeping the players forever 
this first startup draft is going to be huge. Right. It's usually anywhere from like 26 to 32 rounds, meaning you're going to have 26 to 32 players on your roster, also meaning that the waiver wire is going to be super small. The yeah. way that the teams turn over and you differentiate is through each year, right? You have the one startup draft and you don't do a startup draft ever again, but you have a rookie draft the following year, which is all of the incoming rookies. And that right. is where people get crazy about the rookies. And that's that's usually four or five rounds. That's really what you're drafting yep. in that rookie draft. Yep. So your team will turn over through the rookie draft as well as trades. It, it, Dynasty leagues, you've never seen trade heavy leagues until you've been into a dynasty league. Like your redraft, your redraft league might do some trades or whatever. A lot of the times you will do your startup draft and then you look at your roster maybe three or four years later and you might have like two players remaining from Correct. that original startup draft. Well, tr trade volume is crazy. And that's why like having such a deep bench is so nice because like in redraft one, everyone's playing with the same goal in mind. Mm -hmm. In dynasty, you don't have to always play with the same goal in mind because you're playing not just for this year, you're playing for the long, the long haul. And you're going to end up trading. If you want to go get a guy, you need to fill a need. Waiver wire is probably not always going to be the place you can do that. Guess what you have to do? Figure out who trade. your friends were that you started this league of because you got to trade with them. Yes, sir. All and right, and so that's that. why having good league mates is going to be beneficial to you in the long run because the only way to fix your team or change your team is by going to those league mates. And that's why Andrew and I are not in the league together. <laughs> 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 All right, let's talk about the draft types. You have Snake, which is the normal, you know, you have the 112. You also have the 201, the linear is you have the 101, the 201, the 301, the 401, which we'll touch on a little bit later when we get to rookie <coughs> drafts. Then you have auction, your basic auction. Now, one setting that I think is interesting that I feel like has gained a little bit more popularity is third round reversal. Yeah. Now, third round reversal is if you have the 101, it's, it's set up as a snake draft. You have the 101, you have the 212, and then instead of also having the third... 301. The 301, you now have the 312. So the third round reverses... And what this does is, like, you have the 101, you automatically get the Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. That is such a heavy advantage from being at, like, the 112, or maybe you're getting, like, a running back. Maybe you're getting an iffy quarterback. Maybe, you know, whatever the case may be. The advantage at the 101, 102, 103 in startup drafts is enormous. So I kind of, the first couple times I played third-round reversal, I was like, uh, I don't really fuck with this. But I came to realize that it was only because it was a new type of setting and I'm like I think this is actually fair because when you are at the back of the first you're like this is fucked when this guy gets like three premium picks yeah. and also like the best player in the draft how do you guys feel about third round reversals I, I think it's almost every draft that I've done in the last two years has been a third round reversal I, I tried to mix it up once and not do third round reversal and subsequently the entire league voted on it and heavily nine to three was in favor of third round reversal. So I, I, I don't know that we get away from third round reversal at all. I think it's the most fair way to do it because like you just said, if you get the 101, there, there's, you're trying to offset the difference between how drastic the 101 and the 112 are in startups. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the rest of time having these guys, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Hurts, that type of tier versus you're drafting quarterbacks that have issues or getting to a skill player that maybe doesn't have the same shelf life. You got to offset that with a third round reversal, I think. Yep. Yeah, I, I've – done third round reversals but it's something that I like but I've had league mates who shut down the vote and said we don't want to do that and I think it's kind of what you were talking about Nick where it's like you didn't necessarily like it at first because it was a change they didn't right. like the change but I, I do like the third round reversal if it was my choice and my choice only starting a league that's what I would be doing yeah that that was the clear takeaway for me was like I didn't it's way fairer more fair to do it that way you're going to be like what the hell is this because you're not used to it at first so I think my ideal settings are a snake draft with third round reversal. Hang. Yes, sir. Once you're in here, enough. I don't want your text <laughs> messages. You're going to go to the little settings icon on the top, yep. and you will go through all these, and we'll go through them with you right now. Let's head to the general tab up there. you got the name. You've got dynasty teams, classic versus best ball. We don't really have to go through that. What I do think, and this is the way I feel about uh, – redraft as well and I think you guys are probably on board with this but the waiver type should wouldn't thousand percent be set to fab bidding every time yep. every single time now fab bidding for those y'all that are new free agent acquisition budget once a week or you know multiple times per week there will be a blind bid overnight everybody puts in bids Pukunuku is a free agent I put twelve dollars he puts twenty two dollars he puts forty two dollars there's a place to input that on the waiver wire we don't see each other's bids it processes in the morning 5 a.m whatever whoever has the most Money put towards that player, gets that player, and they become the owner of that player. Now, that subtracts from their budget, obviously. So, normally, you could start with $100. You could start with $1,000. It doesn't really matter on the budget. It's all relative and ratio. Yep. Yeah. 
I, that's what I like to do too. You think about the fab in percentages and not necessarily the dollar amounts. Yeah. And I, I do think the way that we have it set up in the off season, we allow after the NFL draft, we allow waivers, blind bids once per week. So every Wednesday in season, it's every day except Monday, Tuesday. So mm-hmm. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it runs 5 a.m. So you could blow your entire load, pause really early in the season and then not have budget left, which I don't think is a bad strategy. We're not really here to talk about strategy, but because like I said before, the waiver wire is so bare in dynasty leagues that like the chance of you getting a real impact player is small. So when you have the upside, might as well shoot your shot. We, in my leagues, we usually do it every day. So, you know, pick your poison on when those waivers run as much as you want, as little as you want. But I I think having them roll like that every night is the way to go. Yep. Uh, Let's, let's talk a little bit about trade vetoes. Because this is a little bit different in Dynasty because I think a lot of players are like, un, a lot of people that get into Dynasty are a little bit like unaware of how trades work, you know, and they might send some crazy shit. I almost, I don't know in my years of commissioning, which has been a long and, and many leagues, if I've ever actually vetoed a trade. I'm very against veto yeah. uh, because I think. You got to learn. You got to learn your mistakes. And what everybody thinks, what, you know, what we think is a unfair trade today. A year from now, it could be a very lopsided trade in the other direction. And if you were to veto that at this point, you know, you could be hurting them long term. I just don't really, I think, let people have the freedom to trade how they want. So, yeah, to that point, every person is buying into this league. And unless there's a way that you can tell me that there's collusion, that you can prove that, there's no way that you can say that that trade should be vetoed because everybody has their own interest. If the rest of the league is going to have an interest to veto that trade, for their own little team reasons. And basically collusion is the only way, shape, or form I ever think that a trade should be vetoed. And honestly, if you can prove collusion on a trade that needs to be vetoed, like Kick those them dudes got to go and, again, okay. assess who your friends are. Because if you have collusion going on in your league, that's just – I've actually yeah. never seen it. Collusion, collusion's got to be out. Veto – you can't allow vetoing. A, a, there's a difference between a bad trade and a – collusion type trade obviously yes. bad trades happen they happen in the real world they happen every day you got to let them play out uh people don't necessarily know what they're doing but they need to learn that's like the, yeah. the the whole fucking point of playing dynasty well and how many times have we made a trade that we thought was good at the time of, of the course. trade and it was yep. a bad trade yep and you can't open up vetoes because everybody will veto every trade and you'll right. never get a le- uh, one through and every league is going to be different in the market and the situation there are certain teams that end up you know trying to compete now and then they have to try to rebuild and they're in a basically a fuck situation. Mm-hmm. They make trades that everyone else will say is bad, but they're doing that with their team in mind. They, yep. They're they they're governing their team, and you have to do that for yours. Don't When you start getting in the mix of vetoing trades, you just it's going down a rabbit hole of disaster. Yeah, as soon as you're worried about other people's teams, you got fucking problems Stay with your Stay in your team. lane. Stay yep. in your fucking lane and shut your mouth. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to jump around after this one last discussion, trade deadline. This is kind of like a popular topic right it now is. in the Dynasty community. Because for this reason, dynasties play differently, right? You might have 12 teams in a league. Three of them might be in pure rebuild mode. Like you might have three teams that go one in 15 or two in 14 or 15, whatever the case may be, because they are essentially tanking to get higher picks in the rookie draft. Like they want to add Caleb Williams. They want to add Marvin Harrison. And so by the time week 12 rolls around or whatever, there's clear divides between the teams that are going for the playoffs. It's not redraft where it's like everybody's just going for the championship in one year. Teams are taking very, very different strategies in how they want to approach the league. So trade deadlines, I like enacting them because I think by really? week 12 or week 13, I don't like when people are just selling the farm and it kind of ruins the playoff picture in my opinion. I'm, Interesting. I'm the same as him. I and oh. pro trade deadline in my dynasty leagues. Now I'm all for you pushing that trade deadline back further, but I, I don't like, I know that you're saying it's a popular topic because people right now are not doing trade deadlines in dynasty leagues. And that's right. probably what you're going to get into, but you I just don't like state the your, idea. State your case. State your case. I don't like the idea of having people be able to make those playoff swing trades all the way down at the championship game. And I, I've heard, you know, you want to be able to sell guys whenever the opportunity arises for those <laughs> teams. But I, I like having – I feel like if you're not making the trades at the deadline, you're not doing a good job preparing as a manager for the playoffs. And so – What it does is kind of, like, minimizes the risk of the league being super fucking volatile. Because, yes. like, those, like, super altering types of trades – It minimizes – It's league. taking down variance. It's taking down variance. The earlier you trade, like, <clears throat> earlier on, the less, less impactful, I guess, it will have long-term for the yeah. most part. Okay, so 
I, I get what you're saying. Now, the, the way I look at this, uh, if you go back to, like, the, the vetoing trades, right, we don't want to tell teams what they should or shouldn't be doing. Like, I look at it this way. We basically, if you're in a dynasty league, right, when you're in a redraft league or a keeper league, keeper leagues are a little different. You can probably trade whenever. But in dynasty, the whole idea is basically to trade with people all the time, right? You, you want to create that environment of, like, discussion trades. Like, imagine we're playing. Everybody's putting in whatever X amount of dollars into the pot, and we're saying, all right, we're all playing for this. We trade literally all day, every day, like Vegas. It never sleeps. But now when, when we're going to decide who has going to get the money, now nah, you can't trade. Like that, the, it, the more I think about it, it's actually kind of crazy. Like, for example, if you build up a really good team and you got hit with two, like, really untimely disaster quarterback injuries week 14, like now you're just you're, – your whole season's screwed. Welcome to the game. Pal. You don't get to change your bet once now, they start spinning that roulette but, wheel. But, but now the reason I say that, though, is because circle back to the veto in trades. Like, if they want to at that point try to correct that error, why can't they do that? Why shouldn't they be able to do that? And another team that's rebuilding, let's say, be able to get off of some people that they wouldn't be able to get off of in the, in the offseason right now. You, know why you, the, you could find two teams that, like, align interest. You know why the NFL I, – I think that's great, and I think you could do that at an earlier point. I just think some of the trades that happen right before the playoffs, if you let the trade deadline not exist, are going to be so drastic. Yeah. Like, I mean, you're in a championship matchup, and you're like, you got your lineup set, and then some dude gets gives, Lamar. gives your opponent Lamar for like the 107 or some shit like that. It's like, dude, that kind of like ruins the fucking league. Now, it, to that point, yes, but there's also. Why does, the NFL tra- why does the NFL have a trade deadline? Why does the NFL have a trade deadline? Yeah. I mean, because I actually don't know. Why do they have a I trade deadline? I mean, it's deadline? for this reason. So shit doesn't get like fucked up towards the playoffs. I mean, I guess so. Um, I, I would say this, though. Like, at the same time, let's say one, one thing that I've, I have almost all my leagues don't have a deadline. Be, I might have made that up. I might have just straight <laughs> Actually, lied. Honestly, I, th- I think that I, is. I don't, we I'm, weren't going to fact check you. Yeah. you see, he's but someone would. He's so. wearing a cap. You, you've seen him with a cap. No caps here. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but, no, I think, like, I've actually been in uh, a bunch of leagues that don't have a trade deadline. So, let's say I'm in the wild card, and, like, my team really is kind of a fraud, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm in the playoffs. I lose. Like, I could be looking at my team right now and saying, oh, man, like, I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere. I'm kind of fucked here, and I'll, I'll be out. But now I have some players that I could actually sell that have some value to go win right now. And now, I, because of that, I have to hold them all throughout the – until basically until the, the draft happens. Couldn't it's you fair. have done that, though, in week 13 or week 14 but why would I when do that you if, had the chance? Yes, but then I would be trying to sell before the playoffs. Some people want to see themselves lose in the playoffs. <sighs> Make that decision earlier. But wh- here's my question with the, the deadline. Why are we telling teams, like, when and when they can't do stuff? Like, if, if two teams decide they want to trade at all points, like, when the money's on the line is when we decide we don't want to let them trade with each other? Like, to me, it kind of feels I, I, I agree that's super fair. I don't really have a – I don't – I'm not, like – I'd be fine if, if you guys want – this is a decision you, you and your homies got to make, obviously. Yeah. And I'm kind of fine. It's not one that I have, like, a super hard stance on. I, yeah. I, I personally, like, I feel very strongly about it that way because I played in both. I will say this, though. I would, let, me, let me make the challenge to you guys and to everyone listening. Play it and see for yourself. Because yeah. I actually feel like a lot of people, it's very polarizing. It's a big topic. It I is. feel like a lot of people that say no, they've never tried it. I have. and I, Okay, so there's it, like a I, year I'm not actually ruined, saying you guys have our playoffs, but like it, it, yeah. some and trades went down that you didn't like. You felt yeah. like we're bad for the league. And, yeah. okay. and in my leagues, we, we have trading open, you know, Outside of those four weeks of the playoffs or the three weeks of the playoffs, you have 335 other days of the year where we're trading. So, like, mm-hmm. it, it is the only t- three-week period where we're not doing it. Yeah. And, and then I put it like this, too. Like, we don't turn off waivers. We do. Oh, you do? In the we, playoffs? I don't, I don't. Oh, no, not in the playoffs. So, no. But, but for right, – true that, true that. So right yeah. after the playoffs. So, so. so, for example, like, going back to that fab thing, right? So let's say you had those injuries, but you had already your your strategy wasn't about that. You blew all you blew the money. Now you can't even go get your replacement because you don't have fab, and you can predict those injuries. That's more strategy in the way you use your fab too, though. You can be, yeah. but again, that's also like not something you can control. Fair right? enough. Yeah. All right. but like you said, Nick, you got to set it up the way your homies want to set it, it up with you and everything. But you yeah. do what's best for you. I, yeah. I, I, I made the case for why I think that's, it should be. That's off. the side of both or both sides of the coin there. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I don't. I don't think it's necessarily going to make or break your league, but there are things to consider, obviously. Go put in the comments why you want it off. Trade deadline or no trade deadline? Uh, Let's move to scoring before we move to roster settings, and then we'll move back to other stuff right now. Let me make a point real quick before you jump into this. I think this part here is very important, and scoring, when you make scoring, it should be one of two ways in my opinion. One, 
you have everybody that gets in the league kind of agree on what the scoring is, or when you make the league, it's set and pinned in the chat, and this is what the scoring is. If you want to be a part of it, this is what the scoring basically is. There's no negotiation. Just very clear. And the reason it, it, everyone needs to agree early, because to move and change scoring after the league has started, it's always got to be unanimous, in my opinion. Facts. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the thing with Dynasty Leagues. You cannot – you like, the amount of comments I have from people who I know are beginner Dynasty players because they make comments like this, they'll start a draft – and their start draft will be like a one quarterback league, and then next summer they're like, "Can we change the super flex?" Like, of course not. You can't. You, you can't you, do that in the middle. You need of like league. three years to make that people, change, man. Because the, not the, even. You need a new league. And the reason to that point, it's basically no matter what the scoring is, people are going to start building their rosters around what the scoring settings are, and any change you make, unless it's unanimous, is because it's going to help certain teams that have certain players that are going to be what the projected new scoring is. So yeah, it needs to be yeah, agreed upon exactly. early and stay there. Typically what I would do as a commissioner is I would like, if we're in group me or discord or whatever the fuck we're in, I would go through any of the league settings that are customizable that we think are going to be impactful. And I would just put a vote out there. Whatever yeah. has the majority ends up you, being. You did that with fade the fetal. I thought that was actually and, really good. And yeah. sleeper actually allows you to poll and do the, in the polls chat. in the chat right. there too. So you can do that all in sleeper. Yeah. So I don't want to go too like heavy into the quarterback <laughs> settings for the most part. I, uh, 25, yards for a point or 20 yards for a point don't think it's a huge difference i actually really like six point passing touchdowns and then minus three for interceptions that's what mm, i play interesting that's yep. my favorite that's i don't I, I don't think it really matters for two the only difference will be your draft strategy realistically obviously in a six point per passing touchdown league you might value a dude like herbert over uh that was going to be a bad example of like Lamar, but you know someone who's m- typically more pass heavy than yeah. run heavy kind of thing. It kind of balances that rushing that's upside. That's not a bad example. Well, that's, a, that's a good example. Yeah, I, yeah. I, the only reason I knew Herbert had a bad year and Lamar had a great year, so like Lamar might actually have yeah. more passing touchdowns yeah, than Herbert yeah. this year. So right, uh, yeah, I think you can keep that pretty basic. Rushing yards, the same thing: ten for a point, six rushing touchdown, whatever. You can you can add things in like rushing first down. I tend not to do that. I think people with Dynasty, Dynasty right now is a progressive game pretty much, right? People who are playing are like into fantasy football and want to do the next cool thing. Rushing first down seems to be something that's kind of like pushed, but there's no, like you're never watching a game and they show you the stats. You're never on a website where they show you the stats of first downs. So it feels like it's being forced. How do you guys feel about like the bonuses? Because you get like the receiving bonuses, the rushing bonuses. I don't like playing with the bonuses, but I know some people do. I, I actually... I play um, in a fair amount. I, I like having a, a high. I like having some that have it and some that don't. Mm-hmm. Um, I think like to the point like if you know if everyone agrees and you know the rushing first downs are something you want to have like you're literally watching that yellow line all the time. Yeah. Like okay, yeah. cool. But I will say we did uh, one thing that's that's cool because we'll go through the scoring settings and the one thing I want to talk about is uh, the receiving right. So yeah. most point most of the time I play in a lot of like half PPR redraft which I like but I love the full PPR dynasty for whatever reason. But my favorite thing in the world to do is at this bottom here, you see reception bonus, RB, reception bonus, wide receiver, reception bonus, tight end. Now, what I think makes Dynasty so great, and obviously we'll talk about Superflex and why that's the premier, uh, pref- preferred type of setting, is like trades are so heavy, you want the trade pool to be huge, and you want a lot of players to have a lot of value, right? If you're just yeah. playing half PPR, one QB, it's like the workhorse running backs have all the value. And it's like if you don't have one of those, you're probably not winning the league. So – Tier PPR is something that I've fallen in love with. And tier PPR means you set the regular receptions to 0.5. And realistically, you could do this kind of in any format. But 0.5, reception bonus for running backs are zero, so they get normal 0.5. Reception bonus for wide receivers are 0.5, so they would get 0.5 for regular, and then 0.5 for bonus, so they get one full PPR. And then tight ends get a point. So we're looking at running back half PPR, wide receiver full PPR, tight end 1.5 PPR. Mm -hmm. What this does is it makes all the positions more valuable because now instead of saying like, hey, I might put Javante Williams in my flex, you might be thinking, "Mm, actually, I'll play Evan Ingram. So you might draft like two or three tight ends more than you normally would. And since you have a huge roster, it's another like strategy differentiator where it makes the draft like crazy. So huge fan of uh, tier PPR. Yeah, Yeah, I I like tier PPR. I, I, I like having a lot of different variations. Like one thing about sleeper, um, the ability to customize this how you want, like you, because you can also, if you see the yard reception bonuses, yeah. mm-hmm. I don't prefer it as much, but you can also like tier PPR literally by 
the like how yeah. long the catches are. So you can do a whole lot of customizable stuff here. You can juice up like some leagues. You can really juice up the tight end premium. Like you saw Nick had on tiered PPR standard, right? It's a half PPR for a running back, full for a receiver, one point five per catch for the tight end. You can get up to two if you want to for the tight end position. If you want to juice that up, you can kind of customize this how you want to. Um, I also think it's it's probably good to stay relatively simple. Like it, it's probably hard enough to convince all your friends that like, hey, let's start a dynasty league, and then yeah. changing all the settings and stuff. So. Love tier PPR, maybe if you're a little bit more experienced. If you want to do, you know, just regular half PPR and maybe the tight ends get a half point extra, I think that's a really good route to go to as well if if, if you're having a hard time convincing your friends of these changes. Yeah. And if you, I, to that point, if you're newer or this is one of your first dynasty startups, I would stay a little more vanilla in the first yeah, time doing I'm, it. I am very pro, though, like – doing the tight end premium even if you want to just do the full ppr for the running back wide receiver and then you want to add a little bit of a premium for the tight end very pro doing that and i think other variations which we'll talk about in like roster settings there's a million ways you can make more positions valuable and i think in fade the fetal we actually have the setting where you get bonuses for carries correct yeah it's very small 0.2 points per carry 0.2 per carry so it's not half yard per carry every 10 carries you're getting two points so it's not like a game changer but it does help like now wide receivers and tight ends who catch a lot of passes are getting (laughs) such a premium now it brings in okay running backs who get a lot of carries like they're they're worthless if they're not scoring touchdowns now it's like you get 15 carries an extra three points pretty good it also uh to the point when you were talking about passing you got a six point per passing touchdown and that might skew things towards the passer but now all of a sudden that point two points per carry helps out guys that are going to run the ball like justin fields and Lamar. so now you have pass catching running backs matter carry running backs matter wide receivers matter tight ends matter quarterbacks matter like everyone matters now you know yep solidified um those are really the only like scoring settings that i really ever fuck with and think that really need to be changed um don't play in any leagues with kickers or defense we'll get into the actual roster settings in a second but yeah like tier ppr i love six point and minus three touchdown interception if you want to go four two that's fine as well yep you can you can if you want to go into the miscellaneous or bonuses like Andrew was talking about if you decide you want to do some stuff with that. But yep, yep. Let's get funky with the roster now. I'm gonna set up my <laughs> ideal roster and then we oh, can work through it. Let's hear this. Sounds good. Th- th- this I think is actually a pretty important step. I agree. It's as simple as that. So you got your starting quarterback, okay. two running backs, three receivers, a tight end, two regular flexes, a super flex, and then 18 bench spots. So you have. 28 roster spots altogether. You yep. could bump that up to 30 if you wanted to. It doesn't really matter. Um, but, he, yeah, this this is it for me. I like to keep it simple. Always super flex again. It opens up the trade market, which is super valuable. It makes the startup draft way more enjoyable. You're valuing qu- quarterbacks the way that they should be valued. In yeah. NFL. I actually set my lineups up pretty much the exact same way. The only difference that I do when I do my leagues is we do a little bit deeper of a bench. Okay. Um, and, and it's really just With the same start time? Yeah, we start 10, we do the three wide receivers. Like, we set it up the same way, but we just do deeper benches. So, some of mine, like, are as deep as, like, 30 bench spots. So, like, the waivers are very depleted, but you have to draft those guys in, like, fifth rounds of your rookie drafts and things like that and hold them on taxi squads (laughs) and things. Yeah. Uh, Now, is that – that does that include the five taxi spots when you have that? It's 30 bench spots with the six taxi slots. So, so, you, so, it's so it's 24 bench spots. Okay, so this is only active Oh, you, you, so you're this saying – take yeah. into that account. You're yeah. saying roster spots, not bench spots when you said 30. Right? Yeah, so 24 bench spots, six Got taxi. It. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. okay, yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, the the I would say this. When you're setting up a league, if the way I think about it, and the reason I say 12 teams, if you're going to set this up and the things to think about, if you have 10 teams in your league, the player pool is not going to be spread as far, as far apart. So most of the teams are going to be – stacked a little better the more teams you get that's where if you get more advanced like 14 now the league can get very skewed and there's a the yeah. player pool gets spread a lot further apart tough to get quarterback exactly the, the scarcity too. comes into this, stuff like that now when you set this up here like start nine start ten is a is what you'll see standard um like it, i think it just set it up to have it start nine right right out of the gate right i think so and we took out kicker defense added in the super flex <laughs> so that's basically and quarterback and super flex so that's two quarterbacks right mm-hmm. two running backs Two receivers, a tight end, and those two flexes is the standard. You add the third in, that's nine or ten is typically what you'll see. The reason to keep this in mind is the more starters you add, it's going to make depth more important. The The smaller the starters are is going to really, like, shallow out. You're going to be wanting more hammer studs in your lineup, and you're not going to care as much about the depth. So those are things just to think about um, when you set up the settings. I'm not going to say what's right Good or point. wrong. I play in a lot of them. But just understand when you set up those teams – and when you set up the, the roster spots, it can change a little bit of the dynamics of what you value in 
players. And it'll change the, the league market Correct. of, like, what, what is valuable and what are you going, trading for. Like, that's you 100%. A, you had a fourth wide receiver in there, then wide receivers will go quicker in the draft and yeah. be harder to and, come And when you talk about, by. like, players mattering, right? So if you're in a start nine league, a guy like Christian Kirk, not saying he's not valuable, people may not covet him that much. But if you're starting, let's say, 13, all of a sudden, like, everybody wants to have guys like that because they're going to start Christian right. Kirk everywhere. So yep. just little things to think about. Yep. Not not drastic. I will say just one more it. quick note. Uh, definitely go with a super flex over two quarterbacks because, like, a uh, point you brought up before, it's like you get fucked in the playoffs and one of your QBs goes down. You want to at least have the option. Like, everyone's going to start two quarterbacks, but there's a chance that you get two injured quarterbacks or whatever, and you need to start a wide receiver or a tight end or running back in the flex spot. So go super flex over two quarterbacks, and then just trust us on the never kicker, never defense. Just Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. for redraft. Yep. Yeah, um, if you, and if you understand if you go two quarterbacks – People said there's not really a difference. Superflex, you can start anybody in that spot. Yep. Quarter, two quarterback league, you can't. You have to start Mason Rudolph or whoever else you can fit in there, or you don't have one. I think, like, if this year, maybe when Justin Herbert went down in the playoffs, like, you have to go play Easton Stick, or you could maybe play Chris Godwin in that Superflex. You'd probably rather play Chris Godwin. Yep. Right. I want to jump right back to IR spots, and then I want to go to the startup draft settings, and then we'll come back to Taxi Squad and explain that entire cool. little thing for him. So IR, you guys have a preference on number of slots. I typically do, I typically have two IR spots, but I'm super open to having like three or four. And then the dudes that are, a lot of redraft leagues play where it's like, if you're ruled out, you're on IR. I'm like, nah, like this dynasty, if you're on the IR, you're on, you're allowed to go onto the IR. Yeah, That's so, the way I've always played. So I, because I play in deeper Hang. benches, it is like Same five or chest. six, five or six IR is what I usually do. And we do... You have to be on IR. There is no out. Or if you're on, like, the pup or, sure, or yeah, maybe to. sometimes we've allowed suspended people to go in some of those leagues. But other than that, like, it's if you're not playing, that's when you're down there. But if you're just out for a week, you yeah. sit on the bench. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't really think it's a big deal as long as everyone agrees on it. I, I tend to say because the benches are so long in Dynasty to make them – on the smaller side. Yeah, I, I, the only reason I like it having it bigger is because I've been in leagues before where, like, you have a, a team of 28 roster spots, and by the end of the league, you have literally, like, 10 guys on IR, and you're like, holy fuck. Like, For sure. Yeah. These guys. That, that's one of those things where, like, I, I think it comes down to the way you set it up. I, and I have no problem with saying, like, all right, you had that variance, just like everyone else can say that in the playoffs. and You have that variance, you got to make tough decisions sometimes. Yep. The, the IR is not going to make or break your league. No, it's not. It's just something worth, you know, kind of talking about. For sure. So, the draft. Yes. Now. This is probably the most important. If we talk about setting a league up for longevity, this is going to be the most important section of the video, in my opinion. And I have some unpopular advice for people starting a new Dynasty League that I would never put into effect, but I think it will help people that are right now. And you tell me what you think. Let me ask you this first. Okay. What is, like, the number one way that a Dynasty League gets ruined? I would, I mean, technically for me, I would say the number one way that a dynasty league can get ruined is when you start getting orphan teams and the league gets pretty lopsided because of orphan teams and things like that. Yeah, so I, I think it's more it's more so when teams decide to push their chips all in and you don't really set barriers for um, protecting against that. And now you're trying to fill really, really bad as I spill. Hang. Hang. Love to see it. It's only our second episode. We'll never figure it out, but I'm allowed to say that until I it's like I don't episode know what 200. I was saying. Oh, uh, Giant. what was I saying? Anyway, I, I was asking like what le what ruins a league, and realistically, I, when you play in a dynasty league, sometimes like at this point, you probably only play in leagues where like other people have played in leagues as well. But a lot of the the leagues I started with, and a lot of leagues that you guys are starting with, if you're new, are gonna be with people that don't know how to play, that have never played, and you might be in a league with like four dudes who have played a lot of dynasty and eight dudes that have this might be their first league. So what ruins leagues right away are extremely lopsided trades, especially in the startup draft. Someone giving up like a veteran guy might have like the 105 in a startup draft, unbelievably valuable, might trade that 105 to, to a new dynasty player for like their third, fourth, fifth, future first, future first or whatever like that. Incre incredibly lopsided, but you don't think about it because you don't really value future picks. So yes. I've seen leagues just go absolutely astray from – extremely crazy fucking lopsided trades in the startup draft. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So my suggestion is one of two things. If you guys are all brand new to it, you can do either no trades in the startup draft. You draft as if it's just a normal snake draft. This obviously downgrades variance and make sure there's no insane trades. Mm. The other suggestion, if you want to still allow trades is set a mark 
in the draft where you're like trades don't open up until after round four or after round five. So by that point, everyone has their first four players on the board. There's nothing insane going on. And by the time you pick that player, like I, I picked Lamar Jackson, like I might be open to trading the 107, but now that I drafted Lamar Jackson and I have four players on my team, probably less likely to trade it. Cause I've just seen leagues get so lopsided so quickly from the start. If p- people are different experiences in dynasty leagues. Yeah. So setting up some trade barriers, I think in the startup draft, can go really far if you're new to it. We we had a league like that actually, where very quickly the league got very lopsided, and we lost a couple people that That's didn't want to re- play anymore. Right. And then now, like three years later, we still have like five teams that are really competitive, and like five or six teams that really just are punting right. every and, year. And if you don't allow trades in the startup, on paper, everyone has around the same value of a team. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll admit, like. When I'm in a startup, I'm looking to see if there's any of those fish out there. And Me too. I'm trying to find exactly. a way to go. But we want to set up a league value. for longevity. But no, no, no. But it, to the it, point, I would say this. Like, I, I think you can do it however you want to. I probably would leave it on. But I would definitely say, if you're watching this and you're setting it up and you have people that are inexperienced, I, I would give them a, a heads up. Like, be mindful of trading. One thing that people don't typically know when they first start playing, one of the hardest things to know is understanding what a startup pick looks like. Yep. what a rookie pick looks like and how that compares to players, right? Yep. And that's why in a startup, if someone makes trades that they have no idea what they're doing, basically make people aware that are new, be very careful about what you're trading in a startup because you don't have any idea what that means. And there are free resources out there too. Like you can go look at keeptradecut.com. You can look at fantasycalc.com where you could insert like, here's a startup pick, here's a rookie pick, here are players. And they'll give you like a relative value. And I think that's great in the sense that like, if you're a, a bowler and it's a, you want to play with bumpers, mm-hmm. you could still make trades for guys that you like that you lose the trade, but don't get absolutely wiped, right? Yeah. Like don't get your ass handed to you on a trade. And I was, I was just going to bring that up because Keep Trade Cut does do the, the option to select a startup trade so yep. you can see what those startup picks are compared to like rookie picks and things like that. So we, we actually on our website, we have a like, we have a trade calculator thing that will give you basically through ADP, right? So you'll say, what is Debo Samuel worth? And it'll say that's the 6'11". And then we have an idea of what that looks like in rookie picks. Just to give you a heads idea if you're brand new and don't have any idea of what the conversions look like. What's so the website? SouthHarmonFF.com. Cool. Anyway. I like that little tag team match. It's cute. No? It was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the tr- yeah, like the trades can go haywire quickly. So I, I do really, really suggest putting some cap to it. And what's funny is like, that's another way to weed out people like you, right? Like if you're if you're trying to start a competitive league with your friends or whatever, you got three people who are like really into it, and you tell those people like, "Hey, we're doing a trade limit in the startup draft." You're probably not playing in that league, right? Yeah, I mean, I, unless unless you know they're like, looking to take and, advantage of you. Unless, we're unless a bunch of boys, sharks in the water. My boys, yeah, I agree with you, hundred like, percent. And, like and, if, and like there's no I, problem if, with that. If you tell me I'm playing in the league with Andrew and we and we put those guidelines there, I'm not playing in that. Facts. League for sure. I just, you knew you I were wouldn't take play exactly. in a league with Adam anyways. Right. So I mean, that's just the way it is. He doesn't like to lose. He's got that Mamba mentality. Let's talk about. We get this question a lot. Like, hey, I'm doing a new startup draft. Like, do we put the rookies and the vets in together? And what this means mm. is, like, you will do a startup draft where every veteran is available. And it's like, if you have the 101 in the startup draft, there's also a secondary draft where it's just the rookie draft, and you will have the 112 there. If you're doing a startup draft, I think, without a doubt, it should be after the NFL draft, and it should be rookies and vets included totally together. Totally agree. Yep. Totally I, agree. Yeah, Across I, the board? I yep. don't think there's any other way. And, and I, I personally don't. Now, I'll say this. I agree with that point. I think, though... For the bumpers perspective, for people that don't have any idea, if you guys are all like brand new first league, that might be an exception where you do it separate to understand the differences. So you start doing the rookie draft earlier to kind of visualize what that looks like. Okay. Yeah. My I only th- pushback. That's, ol- that's the only yeah. time I would even ever suggest it. I was going to say too, because I think if you're all new to it, you all probably don't know how to value the rookies. So they would all fall in unison. Like right. it's Which I think is fine because that's a league trend. My right. only pushback would be like, you can get really lucky or unlucky based on what the rookie class is. Like the year that like Saquon was the one-on-one or whatever, like a very high value one-on-one pick is like, you'd rather have that. You rather have the one twelve and maybe the rookie one-on-one because that one-on-one in the rookie draft might actually be like, like Caleb Williams is going to end up being probably, if he goes one-on-one, he's going to be a first round startup Startup pick. So realistically, if you got the one twelve, you're also getting an extra startup first round pick because the rookie one-on-one is so valuable. So like put it like this though. Would you rather have the 112 in that 101 rookie pick or Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen? A lot of people would rather have that 101 anyway. But you're getting the 112, the 201, and that rookie pick. Right. Yeah. So it's like you're getting three top 13 players or Mahomes and Allen, which at that point I think skews the side. And I I Mm -hmm. think uh, 
just the verbiage of the setting too that we're talking about, you know, doing the rookie draft after the startup or just even in future years when you have to set up that rookie draft. In Sleeper, it's called a supplemental draft, so you have to set up a supplemental yeah, draft. Yeah, we'll get there. Don't worry. That, that, I think, will come after the draft settings because I think that's probably the most unknown part of Dynasty Leagues for yep. most players. But, yeah, that's this setting right here. Available players to draft. You have rookies only. You have vets <laughs> only. But definitely go all at the same time. Let's talk about the actual draft itself because this is one of the more intensive fucking things in all of fantasy football. Now, startup drafts are long. Yep. A lot of rounds. These will take days, usually weeks, I was going to say. The main thing is that, like, if you're used to doing a redraft draft, you're going to probably do one night a fast draft. A couple Basically, hours. Basically, yeah, when you do a startup draft, it's time to inject it into your veins. We're going to be sitting there for days. You're going to do a slow a, draft. It becomes a lifestyle. And yeah, those people that draft. are going to rush you and tell you to hurry up and pick, tell them to shut up. So the reason it takes so long is because what you want to do is set this to eight hours between picks, eight hours per pick. I do twelve. That's because you're a coward. That is, that, that's, that <laughs> but is eight hours, and then you could set slow draft auto pause. So if you're all on the East Coast or whatever, set it to like one a.m. to eight a.m. or whatever. So that way, it's the eight hours, but it's also like seven hours of sleep. So no one, you know, sleep and, schedules are accounted for there. And, yeah. and the clock does not run during that time, but you can still draft. So yes. if you're on the clock. You're, you're not actually on the clock, but it's your pick. You can make the pick. You're just not uh, against the clock, and while you're sleeping, yeah, you're going to get auto It's just so long. People have shit to, Like, no one has the time to sit down and do 28 rounds of a draft, so you spread it out and allow people to kind of, like, live their life. I also will say, if there's no trading involved, if you're doing a startup draft where you don't have trades, you could probably lower that clock to, like, four hours or so because yeah. a lot of that's, a lot of the reason you want time between picks is because you're negotiating trades. Like, hey, I want to move this pick for, like, that player and that pick or whatnot. But yep. the standard is eight hours per pick. Make sure everyone's got notifications on so they get uh, notified when they're on the clock. I think you can even turn emails on so you get an email alert when you're on the clock as well. But that now, is standard. I will preface it. I, I play the 12, but it's because I have league mates that are in the U.K. So, like, there's a 100%. huge time If you're difference. internationally or if you're on, like, West Coast versus East Coast, I think more time yeah. allows that, for it. That's actually the biggest thing. Make sure everyone's clear with it. I've done some which are four. Everyone's okay with that. Make sure everyone's clear and transparent about it. And then if you have it longer, if it's eight or if it's 12 – just be mindful of everyone else. Like, be considerate. Don't sit there on the clock if you can make a pick, right? Yeah. Like, it's there so that people are protected. It's not there for you to abuse it. I know you're you're opening your phone every twelve hours, so don't be sitting there on the I'm clock for twelve, 12 hours, man. Seconds. I know. I know when I'm coming up. I know exactly when I'm on the clock. <laughs> I know when these motherfuckers leave me on read. It's all the time, man. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Literally, in sleeper. You get notifications for that shit. <laughs> so, within your roster, this is another part of fantasy football in Dynasty that will never be a part of redraft. On Dynasty rosters, you have what is called a taxi squad. Think of this as like the NFL has the practice squad yep. where you are drafting players. You have an extra, I like four. Four is usually the ideal slot. These are four players at the bottom of your bench that don't take up active roster spots, but they're sitting there. You're like almost waiting for them to develop. So you might get them off the waiver wire. They're a rookie who needs to wait for like a guy to retire or a guy to move off the team before you think he's going to get a shot. So the point is to have guys that you like that don't have to take up active roster spots. I, I, I think I think of it as a red shirt. So essentially, exactly. right, yep. it's a red shirt because the taxi squad, like you can't steal it like the practice squad, right? These are your players. No one can touch them. They basically have a free year where they're not a roster spot for you. Now, the reason it's like a red shirt, it, no, you never see this in a red shirt, but in a red shirt, you're basically saying this is a year where it doesn't count towards eligibility, right? That's how you think about it to your team. The difference is, let's say you have a guy on taxi that a lot of rookies, you don't project much from them early. But let's say about halfway through the year, you get a guy who's all of a sudden opportunity is knocking. You can take him off the taxi squad and bring him onto your roster. The thing that you have to keep in mind that a lot of people don't know about the taxi squad, as soon as you take them off, they, can't go they back. can never go back on unless oh, yeah. the commissioner ruins it for yeah, you. Yeah, unless – also, I don't know if I mentioned this, but you only put rookies on the taxi squad. Yeah. Okay, it so should be that. Yes. That's why it's like a lot of them are projected not to have a role because they are like you can't put you can't put like Alan Lazar on the taxi squad because you know he's not going to play and you want to yeah. save him or some shit like that. They have to be rookies. Now, I will say the settings that I usually have are I set it to two years. So technically, non rookies can be on, but you cannot have taken them off. So when you put a player on, normally what we do is you have to decide right before the season kickoff, right? So kickoff is tonight, the first game of the entire season. I put my four players on the taxi squad. They are locked into being on the taxi squad. If I move one of those guys off in week three, that moves that guy onto the active roster. So I now have to drop somebody else to move them on there. 
and you can't put anybody else on the taxi squad because that locked in. And if you use a player, random player, like Jason Brown Lee from the Jets, receiver, right? Like people probably don't really know who he is. He got a little buzz uh, this offseason. So I was like, all right, I'm going to pick him up in the summer, put him on my taxi squad. He's been sitting there, didn't do shit this year. So I don't project him to do anything next year either. If I haven't taken him off, I can keep him on through two years. And you can, that's the setting on taxi squad duration. So technically, he's not a rookie. But because I put him on as a rookie and never took him off, you can keep him through two years. Yep, that's what that's what we do, too. We do the two years as well. And like you said, you have to make that decision come the end of the year who you want to keep and who's, you know, what new guys in the new rookie draft are going to be put down there. Yep. That's that's like I actually put too. Bryce Young on the taxi squad and fade the fetal. I don't think I ever took him off. I mm-hmm. had Jaden Reed and I activated him because right. he was balling out. There you go. Like, that's a perfect one. Like, you don't know. Jaden yep. Reed, for all we know, could have not touched the field this year. Still want him on your team, of course. Don't want to take him back to roster spot because you're never going to put him in your starting lineup. Keep him on there, but he broke out, so you take him off. And it's not that big yep. of a deal. Right. And if you got a guy like Marvin Mims, you have him on there, you don't know if you want to take him off, you leave him on. Yeah. If you if the rule's two years, you can keep him on all next year with other rookies too. There's, so there's plenty of guys this year that would have probably been guys you put on the taxi squad, the Aiden O'Connells, the Keaton Mitchells, the things like that that found themselves into opportunity pretty early that you would have activated. Yep. yep. So taxi squad, think of it like he said, red shirt. Uh, my ideal settings for this, just to give you a quick overview for taxi squad slots. Taxi squad duration, two years. Taxi squad deadline, start of regular season. Yes, sir. Now, let's talk rookie drafts, okay? So, again, the biggest difference between keeper, between dynasty, and between redraft leagues are that the only new players coming in are rookies. That's why, like, rookies are being so sensationalized because more people are playing dynasty. We all want to know about the incoming rookie class. So, you have your veteran roster set. The only new dudes you are adding to it outside of trades are the rookie picks. Now, most rookie drafts are four rounds. Some people play five or six or whatever. It really depends on your league. But I would say the standard is four rounds. Now, the worst team in the league, whoever's 12th place, last place, gets the 101. These rookie drafts, almost always, I've never played in a league that does snake, they all do linear, which means if you have the 101, you have the 201, 301, and 401. This is to try to get the league to be a little bit more even, right? If you're parody. the worst team, yeah. parity. If you're the worst team, you want the best player, and you want that in each round. So if you're the championship team, you'll have the 112, the 212, the 312, the 412. Now, just something I didn't really talk about in the startup draft, preferred dates. What I found the sweet spot for your rookie draft is, I would say, a week after the NFL draft happens. You want the info of where they're going on the team. You want the info of where free agents have landed. But you also want to give guys who are not like so dialed in on Dynasty a week or two to prepare and look at the rookies and see what their situation is. So yeah. one to two weeks, if the NFL draft ends on a Sunday, we usually schedule our rookie draft for the following Sunday or the Sunday after that, depending on how the league feels. Yeah. And then on that point, how you guys feel about that, but also when's the best time to do your startup draft? Yeah, I I am doing Thanks. the startup draft after the rookie draft, but the rookie you do the draft, startup draft after the rookie draft I, Refra- after the NFL that. draft after the NFL say. draft. Okay, Sorry, yeah. yeah, I'm doing the startup after the NFL draft. Wait, let's say no, let's say you're starting a brand new league. Like, when's the perfect time for a startup draft? Now, I'm after the NFL like, draft, that's now. what I'm doing. Okay, right it's, after it, it, you no. wouldn't wait till summer. No, well, I'm no, I mean any time after the NFL draft is when I'm doing it. But, but I think there, I mean, like, there's different pockets of like uh, the summer to do it. Yeah. For for a startup or a rookie draft? Startup. I, I think startup season is now. Anytime the NFL season's over. You can start a uh, startup season starts right now. Yeah. For me it's optimal. My but preferred spot is like July. I think early fair. July is good cuz if you might need 2 weeks to do the draft. So you don't want to start it like a lot, a lot of redraft leagues are like end of August early September. Obviously you don't want to do that. You want to give yeah. yourself at least a month buffer cuz you don't really yeah. know how long they're going to take. Now when it comes to the rookie drafts we're a little bit of sicko, so we do it like 8 a.m. Monday morning after the NFL draft Makes is over. Yeah. But that I wouldn't recommend that for new players. I think, again, you need to have time to digest those landing spots, see how you actually feel about these players and things like that, and then you can make those decisions in the rookie draft. Yeah, Forgive my young friend. He's, the sickos, <laughs> they really draft before the NFL draft, but I would not suggest you do that. Doing too I've much. done that before. Doing too much. It's, it's, I I, like honestly, it. though, it, it – Everyone has the same level of variance. I, I think the best part about it is the people that think they know everything, they can get screwed just as much. It just yeah. it just makes it chaotic. Yeah. It's really more just chaotic. It feels chaotic. like it's just, yeah, more chaotic. It's just being degenerate. It's like it's he's just saying being if you're, new to be new. But if it's, like, if you're talking about just levels of sickos, it's just people wanting to do it because they want to be first to the punch. And yeah. there's really, you can know stuff about players and 
all that, but you need to know landing spots most yeah. times. Re- for it realistically, don't do that. I would it, suggest here's the other as a new too. person in here's the league. Here's the other thing, because we're trying to set you up for longevity. You also don't have to do the rookie draft immediately after the NFL draft. I know leagues that do the rookie draft in June or July. Like, you might feel more comfortable really knowing the player's role, yeah. being in training camp. So the rookie draft, all, all it needs to do is happen between when the NFL draft ends and Before when the, the season, season starts. Yeah. yeah. And to that point, I think uh, just make sure that everyone in the league understands, agrees with it. It's the time everyone can get to it. For most people, it should be after the NFL draft. The one thing I will say, about, like from if you do it in May, let's say, right, after the NFL draft versus you go to July or August, remember when you're on the clock in a rookie draft, you can trade the pick. A lot of people think they already have to make this pick. You can trade during the rookie draft. You don't have to ever press the button on any of your rookie drafts. You can trade them all. The reason I say that is understand that people are very rookie crazed in May. When the August time comes around, everyone starts to not necessarily care about the rookies as much. So it's going to be different values on the player picks. And I would, I would actually argue with you in that aspect of when you're on the clock is probably when that pick is the most valuable to trade away. Yep. yep. And just to give you guys a little clarity, it does not say rookie draft in the settings. You'll see supplemental draft rounds. Supplemental yep. draft is, a.k.a. what you said before, is the word for rookie round. So we, like I said, put it at four. And that'll kind of just refresh itself at the end of the year. Now, where I think the playoffs, as you were going to say, matter in Dynasty, is the seeding matters a lot in rookie drafts. It's the difference between getting your, you know, a quarterback in Superflex and getting some, you know, shit wide receiver two that's not really going to make an impact on your team. Right. So, in my opinion, what we just switched to this year, actually, for the first time, is depending, I guess, on where how your money gets dispersed. Right? Like, okay, so let's say it's a 12-team league. Six teams make the playoffs. In our league, we only have the first and second place actually making money. Like, if you get third place, you don't make any money. Yeah. Therefore, you're incentivized to probably throw that game if you're in the third and fourth place game. For a better pick. For a better pick. Yeah. So, what we do in order to combat that is your pick is based on max points four throughout the season. Yep. So, that will – it's automatically – not max points four, but max lineup points – yeah. Like a best ball, almost. Yeah, it's, 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 max, it's max points four, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You, yeah, had, yeah, you had it right. You're right. You yeah. had it right. Yeah. I'm always fucking right. What am I thinking over here? Yapping. Yeah, that's exactly that how wrong. we do it, too. In the non-playoff teams, max point four. Uh, but we do do uh, where the fifth and sixth place game is also max points four, but we play for money in third place, so the winner okay. gets uh, what you want to do is pick. What you want to do is, like, minimize the games in which, like, there's no actual real Nobody's matter throwing. to them. Right, so like max points for what that means is you don't even have to set your lineup. It's automatically going to set your lineup each week. Like your record might end up being 1-15, in 15, but it's saying, hey, if you set your lineup to the best of its ability each week, this is your max points for. So that says like you might have a fucking really good lineup, but you're not setting it. So it's like we are not incentivizing you. You don't get the 102 just because you sat your players. You're a really good team kind of thing. Sa- save yourself a lot of headache and implement – the non-playoff teams are going to be dictated by max points for mm-hmm. because what you'll see, it's a it's a ripple effect. You'll have people that are trying to tank and, and earn the 101, the 102, yep. the 103. But by not just doing that, you have those teams not setting their lineups. The playoff teams that are having records, basically wins and losses, are going to be sometimes because they're playing a team that's setting a, a lineup that's not even close. So yeah. it really can mess a lot of things up. And if you make it max points for – there's no reason for them not to set the best lineup because it doesn't matter. Their best, their best lineup every week is going to total that max points for. Yep. Yeah, the whole so idea is basically it's going to it's going to keep teams from trying to just set terrible lineups to take. Yeah. So and that half, toilet bowl, that consolation bracket doesn't matter at the end of the year. Right. And I was going to say half the time you can't even set the perfect lineup anyway, so it's it, there's no point in tanking at that point. Now, with do that you know lineup. how to set it to max points for on here? Because I cannot find. You have it. to manually go it, in it, and put that at the end of the year. There's actually not a setting. This is something you're going to have to just it, it's in it, it's in the column in the standings at the end, and all you have to do is just. Literally organize your. Oh, it has back. max points for, not just points for. Yeah, yeah. you have okay. to click view details. It'll show max points for, and then you just have to set that draft order. Okay. So, like when That's you go to big. the standings, you'll see the record, and then you'll see a, a list of columns of the Can points for that? and max points for. Uh, hit the standings, go down instead of the playoff bracket. And then right there, standings, the little thing on the right. There you go. View details. Mm, okay, yeah. So you see you hit me the view details just button. walloping the league, and then getting fucking bounced first round. No, <laughs> no big deal. View details, max points four. And if you see. actually click that button, it'll organize it for you. Bang. That, and, that's, wow. and that's what you do, right? So now you'll see that while Nick um, did win the league and s- smacked everyone, it's just because Scott Connor didn't set uh, a <laughs> very good roster. His, his team is unbelievable. Really? Yeah. 
ridiculous. And but Tony, yeah. you know, Tony had a year where he donated to the league pot. Yep. But as you could see, like Cody and Mika were both tanking, <clears throat> but Mika's team was a little bit better. So even though they had the same record, his team had dudes like Devon H. and like pop off. So it's like, okay, he's set up a little bit better next year. So we'll give yep. him a little bit of a worse pick. And I think that without a doubt evens out most of, uh, most of the bullshit along the way. Anything else? Well, one league setting that I play with that I feel very strongly about is a league median. Mm, um, that is in general. I think I did see that. So you'll see so in general. <laughs> what what this means is, right, when I was just talking about the the teams that may set lineups which are really poor, they're not, they're not trying to win games, whether the max points for a set or not. You could play – you could get very unlucky, let's say. You could have a very, very good year. You're scoring unbelievable, but you're having terrible matchups weekly. So you'll end up losing four or five games, but you're one of the highest points for in the league. The median says every single week you're playing not just against your opponent, but you're playing against the whole league. So if you're above median, you get a win. If you're below median, you get an additional loss. This kind of offsets variance for the playoff seating is yep. what it's going to do. Th- yeah, that, that's – it's just something that, like, again, could be implemented for redraft if you want to, like, minimize – those weeks where you're the second highest scoring team and you lose to the first highest scoring team is some bullshit. Like, sure, you get some ma- you get some points for, but you get a loss in the column. Yeah. This will pretty much ensure that you get at least one win. And it, it does truly ensure that the best teams in the league are making the playoffs with the best records, and the worst teams in the league are the ones that aren't making it and are getting the good draft picks yeah. and things. I've like that. I've actually never played with this setting before. I I'm love not. Ag- it. I'm not against it whatsoever. But I also think part of the, part of the thing that makes fantasy fun is the fact that like. You can low key have kind of a shit team, get lucky, and yeah. like talk your shit. And, and that's I, that's the argument, and Hang. and people like that. It's you know, be the Green Bay Packers going into the playoffs, right? But it, look at you in the Packers jersey, Hank. Hey, but, uh, yeah, man, I, I like to have the median. It's it's something that I'm very strongly about in all of mine. I don't, I won't play in a league that doesn't have a median. That's just how strongly mm, I feel about wow. it. Wow, yeah, we got so many parameters. We're so we're so fucking bougie with our dynasty league. It's just picky. Imagine work. being Winch, so, imagine being so rigid about dynasty. I know, know dude. So no, trade deadlines and shit. It, it's it's incredible how rigid you'll start getting with your dynasty <laughs> leagues. Because like, here's the thing: like, you're committing for life. Like, you want to yeah. be in these leagues forever, and yeah. then it's like a couple bad people or a couple bad settings are gonna ruin that shit. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you're like, ah, I don't want to play in this league anymore. And then you look like a dickhead and yeah. all that kind. Of- and you know what? You're gonna find the things you like about it and the things you don't like, and you'll start joining more leagues, and you'll be a degenerate like Facts. us. One other rule that I would really highly suggest one other thing on this note because new dynasty players tend to undervalue the just the future especially like rookie picks mm-hmm. buy-ins when you are doing a buy-in I was gonna get to that yeah when you are doing a buy-in you know it doesn't matter what your buy-in is it could be a hundred dollars could be twenty dollars doesn't matter I also would probably suggest a little bit of a higher range just because it, it uh, naturally just has more commitment to it if you're putting in a hundred dollars whatever but if people want to trade future picks, right? So if you have you have your 2024 firsts, you have first through fourth, you have your 2025 first through fourth, 2026, so on and so forth. A lot of people will just start sending out all their future picks. I'm giving you my first in 2024. I'm giving you my first in 2025 to get good players now. That could incentivize people to sit, sell all their future picks to win a championship right now, take that money, and then leave the league. So what I would suggest is anyone involved in a trade that – involves future picks, 2025, 2026, 2027, whatever it is, you have to pay the buy-in up until that year to make that trade. I don't care what Any side you're on. It's right. a fifth so round pick or anything. Facts. Yeah. So, hi. now, this is actually to the sleeper point. What sleeper's going to do is default set three years of picks, future picks for you. Yep. So, for example, when you go to make a uh, startup this offseason, your 2024 rookie picks it are in theory going to be already be drafted. So you're going to be gone from those. So you're going to start going into this season, 2025, 2026, and 2027 picks available to be traded. Easy to not give a fuck about them. Now imagine away. somebody that says, I'm going to go win right now. They trade away their 25, their 26, and their 27. Future first to go win. It doesn't go well. And now that team is completely barren. The cupboard has nothing. That team's going to be very, very hard to orphan. So when you were at, talking about like what could ruin it, it definitely can be in the startup trades. It could also be the – the owner that leaves a team orphaned with no future yep. and no present. Yeah, and that's the worst place to be in Dynasty. So, so you're, way ma- you're way less likely to make that trade if you got to pay $400 to make a fucking yep. trade. And LA Rams style. You, you, can, you can basically say, okay, if you want to do that, the buy-in's $100. If you want to trade your 25 we need $100 for that trade to go through. If you don't get the $100 in, the trade is reversed. The same thing for 26 the same thing for 27 yep. You also, I think you can take 
down the number of years that you're able to trade. You can't go past three, but I think you can yeah. take down. Can we talk? In, can we talk about this for like commissioners? Because this can be kind of yes. tricky. It's like, all right, we're all all over the country or whatever. Platforms in order to do. Buy-ins. I was just gonna get into that because I I commission every league that I play in. Um, we use League Safe. League Safe, yep. yeah. League Safe is like the standard. They take a tiny little fee when you go worth in it and do it. It's worth it as a commissioner. You can set up multiple years in advance. It's like really creating little safes that you can put all these years League in. LeagueSafe.com. You can, yeah, create yep. the leagues, create the customizability of payouts. I have, it's the rest, I it's have the best one. safes created until like 2028 right now. And it's just guys who oh, I'm finna rob they you say, sure. hey, we want to make a we want to make a trade. This guy's going to give me his 26 first. I say, okay, just go make sure you make that deposit. They're all pinned. You can pin stuff in Sleeper in the chat. We pin all those safe links in there. So anytime you want to make that trade, you just click on the year safe. You make the payment, and it's all good to go. Bang. Yep. Yep. I will uh, bring up, you said orphan, another term that people that are not in Dynasty probably aren't familiar with. Kind of self-explanatory, kind of obvious. But people who leave the league, you got 12 members. Someone drops out at the end of the year. That is called an orphan. Uh, that's called an orf- orphan team, orphan le- or orphan player, whatever the case fucking may It's like Andrew and myself. We're orphans. Yeah, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble saying the fucking word orphan right now. It's a lot of Hanes. But, but what you'll Hanes. need to do is you'll need to fill a slot. So basically, yep. w- w- the process for that is, you know, luckily, if you're joining a league, it's probably through BDGE. You'll have the Discord in order to be able to fill that really, really easily. But normally, if you're just playing with your homies, like, you're going to have to find another person. You're going to yep. have to send them the roster that they have. They're going to have to send them, you know, the buy-in amount and the rookie picks that they have. And the reason to really round – uh, make the whole thing roundabout where it's, okay, why why are you making them pay in? Because now if you have that orphan team and they have to pay for those years, you're going to – no one wants to pay for those years. Right. For but bad teams. So, somebody will take an orphan team, uh, an orphan team meaning that doesn't have it, – it, it's an orphan. It needs a home. Someone needs to have someone to take it over if it's free years. If they have those two years, the team's not very good, but they don't have to pay for it. You can feel that a lot easier than you can saying, hey, you got to pay $100 for the next two years and you don't have any picks. Yeah. Yep. And that's how we do – when you decide to leave a league, uh, we – Usually make a deadline in our league. We say March first. You got to let me know whether you're coming back the next year or not. Yeah. Um, you can make those <laughs> guidelines up for yourself. But once you make that decision, I will refund you for every year that you haven't traded the pick. The years that you've traded the pick, I can either choose to keep the buy-in or half the buy-in or whatever it is when we make that transition to the next person, yep. and then they can play for free or pay. F- for half of the year, whatever it may be, depending on the damage of the team, you might have some teams that are pretty bad, and it's it's a lot harder to fill those rosters than you have some teams that are not so bad. Maybe a guy just left because he needed to cut down a couple of leagues. The roster's yeah. fine. There you are know, some people who are like really intense with dynasty leagues, which I don't think you need to start with. But there are like bylaws, and I actually think we have bylaws written up for all of our BDG leagues. Mm-hmm. Bylaws are literally the like a written up a rule so set kind of contract. This is actually something that I really think yeah, get in deep, big girl. Y- you, you can do it. As, you could do it to the point where you have like a bylaw actually like in a notion or in a Google doc at a minimum. What I would suggest is in sleeper and if you can go show in the general chat, you can type in a message when you first start the league out and you can put your bylaws at a minimum in a message chat. So you can say, don't leave $50, $50 buy-in. You have to pay for future years. You can put all this stuff, and as you do it, you hit the pinned message. And anytime you see that little pin in the upper right of the general chat, mm-hmm. as the commissioner, you should be anything that's very important to the league, you put in that pinned messages. And then that, at a minimum, should be the bylaws, essentially. And, right? and if you don't go extremely deep into it, at least have the stuff that everybody needs to know in that First pin message in your league, and that can be your bylaws. That's exactly what I was talking about, too, where we pin those safes in there. So if you do ever want to make that payment and make that trade, you just click that little pin, and it's easy to get to. Yep, easy. Self-explanatory. Anything else? Actually, I think that's the the main thing. But understanding, making sure that that's one thing you definitely got to protect on a new league is somebody trading away a 25, 26, 27 first may think, oh, man, I'm getting Debo Samuel and all these guys that look like they're going to win now. Injuries happen, guys get old. They lose. All of a sudden, that trade looks horrific, and they don't want to take with this team anymore. Yeah. That can totally um, mess up a league. I will say, as you get, if you decide you want to get into more dynasty leagues, taking over orphan teams is not for everybody, but it's fun because it's a it's a challenge. Yep. So, just I, I would say understanding the orphans and how to protect against yeah, it. Yeah, dynasty is yep. just straight up fun, dude. Like you, you could take many approaches to it. You can go for win now. You can go for. I, there are a lot of dudes that get right into the startup draft and go into a, like, rebuild mode where it's only rookies yep. or they trade for first-round first, uh, first round picks, our next group video is going to be 10 mistakes that brand-new beginning Dynasty players make. So that will be out, I think, a few days from now. So make sure you're subscribed and check that one out when it drops if you are new, want to learn a little bit more strategy and actually playing the game. 
But yeah, man, there's a million different ways to play. It's really, really fun. As soon as you start playing Dynasty, it's going to overtake your love for redraft very, very quickly, I promise. Find your way. You'll love it. You won't regret joining it. Gang, you won't regret Dang. subscribing to either of these two guys' channels, nor the BDG Dynasty channel. Again, if you're on the redraft channel, these will stop being posted on here in a few weeks' time. You'll only be able to get that stuff on the Dynasty channel. Subscribe over there or here if you're new. Thumbs up button. Love y'all. We're out of here. Peace.